this is Tim Pierce. That's a lick I had to play on the Grammys a few years ago. And I studied it almost 200 times before I did so because it's a challenge for me. I have friends here in LA who can sight read that immediately. No problem. And I got friends in Nashville who could hear it once and probably play it. No problem. But I'm not much of a hybrid picker. And this was on national TV and it was, I just wanted to burn it in. So what you're about to see is a conversation about being nervous. And uh, my way of dealing with nerves primarily is over-preparing. So I literally studied this lick 200 times. Uh, and it doesn't take long. I mean, I could do it 10 times probably in the next minute. But uh, click the link below if you want to check out the master class. There's an expanded version of this. And uh, I found a seventh tip. And that is nobody dies when you make a mistake. I look back at all the mistakes I've made in many areas of my life and nobody's died yet. So that gives me comfort moving forward. So make some mistakes, play your guitar and, uh, oh, let me try doing this 10 times in a row. <laughs> on a 12 string, 12, it's hard. Almost. Was that 10? I think it was nine. Aiden, welcome. You are nervous when you play sometimes, as am I. Right. I can, I'm gonna tell you about a very nervous moment I had last summer. But let's, let's start with how we overcome our nervousness and our, our fear of certain situations when we're playing. Mm -hmm. The main thing I do, and tell me if you do this too, is I over-prepare. Over-prepare, over-prepare. Mm -hmm. Do you do that? Absolutely. You know, leading up to uh, the gig, be it a session uh, thing, that if, if I have the opportunity to prepare for it, but definitely if it's a live gig, you know, you always want to get the music ahead of time. But just everything that you can possibly do to make sure you're comfortable mentally with the material. Because the first hurdle to get over is the confidence. Yeah, that... right. For me, it's the emotions too. If I know that I've studied something dozens, if not hundreds of times, if I can, yeah. I know that it doesn't matter what's going on up here. Yeah. I am, my, my hands and my muscle memory are gonna carry me through it. Yeah. And it usually works really well. And it depends. Like when I worked on the Grammys two years ago, I had to learn 80 songs. So my way of preparing was to actually just cycle through all these songs, mm -hmm. go to sleep, get up the next morning. And I had other stuff to do. We all have stuff to do in life. But Absolutely. in your spare time, if you can take 10 days or two weeks mm -hmm. to study up for a one-off gig, yeah. you're going to be much better off, I think. Absolutely. I make Spotify playlists, assuming that the artist's original music, if that's what I'm playing, is on Spotify. If it's just cover work, then obviously it's going to be on Spotify. I make playlists and I'm listening to it when I'm going for a jog or if I'm going to the shops, anything. It's always playing because if I don't know the song beforehand, I have to at least know the feel right. of the song. Right. One of the most nerve-wracking things I ever did was the Grammys a few years ago with Glenn Campbell. And there's a lick in Southern Nights mm -hmm. that Jerry Reed, I think, wrote. Um, Glenn plays it effortlessly. Yeah. And I had to play this lick. And the top descends and the bottom ascends. So in order to play this, you have to go. Oh, easy. And that's not really what I do. I don't do that. And you have to play it fast. It goes. So I get to the Grammys early. We're waiting around all day. We go do our rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And during our rehearsal, who's sitting in the front row by himself watching us having a great time? Paul McCartney. <laughs> So that's nerve wracking yeah. in itself. That's the rehearsal. Yeah. So then during the rehearsal, mm -hmm. I'm realizing that the camera, you know, there's a red light on the camera that's active. And they've got tons of cameras around. Right. That at the moment of that lick, the guy with the close up camera is coming to my hands and the red light's going on. Oh, no. So I'm realizing they're staging that moment for the show as a close up <sighs> on my hands. And so. <laughs> The thing that saved me is that for the three weeks weeks prior to that, I swear to you, I studied that lick. I played it. I, I, I burned it in 
two to three hundred times. Right. I mean, I was sitting there watching TV. I was talking to my friends going, I don't have it right now, but I had it worked up at that point. Right. And that really saved me during that moment because it's that's maximum nerves. You're in a giant, oh. empty, you know, concert hall, Staples Center. Yeah. Paul McCartney's watching you rehearse. You don't want to blow it then. And yeah. then when the show starts, you're realizing that the close-up camera is going to show that moment to the entire <laughs> nation. Yeah. And I just, you know, I allowed for the fact, okay, you may not get this. There may be a blemish mm -hmm. in there. You may not get it right. But yeah. I, I, I just made sure I breathed really deeply. Mm -hmm. There was probably a mantra that I said or something. <laughs> please, maybe. Yeah. Please, please. <laughs> but it went great. And, yeah. and but it, the, the over-preparation, maybe 300 repetitions. Repetition is... Yeah is your friend in those situations. Absolutely, because if you can build it into that muscle memory that you know if everything else went wrong on stage, the, the singer caught fire and, and the drums explode, you know that even if you're watching all of that, your hands are just gonna <laughs> autopilot their way through that, that uh, lick. And you mentioned something that I wanna talk about before we move on, is mm -hmm. if you're subbing for someone, mm -hmm. that adds an extra layer of insecurity potentially because you're not, a, perhaps you're not the person that was their first choice. Right. So right. you have to uh, take more deep breaths yeah. and accept more you know, humility when you go into that situation. Yeah. Especially and, if you admire the person you're subbing. Because yeah. then the pressure's yeah. higher because yeah. there, there feels like there are these big yeah. shoes to fill. If you're a hired gun, you're representing the person that recommended you to sub for them. <clears throat> you're sort of representing the artist. Yeah. On the subject of over-preparation, okay. you and I both do something very similar. We show up early and mm -hmm. we bring... Duplicate sets of gear. Absolutely. A big thing for me is knowing that it's not going to be the gear that fails me. Yeah. Right. You know, or at least that if one guitar, if for some reason something goes wrong, it's a split second fix. I can do it mid-song. You know, and I also bring spare sets of strings and, and tools in case, God forbid, that first guitar goes down and the second guitar, all the strings break. <laughs> It's true. It's really it's, Murphy's Law. And we're in the business of removing worry systematically mm -hmm. uh, when you're showing up for these things. And so I do the same thing. It might I might have something in the trunk of my car that's even uh, not brought in, but I know I could go right out and get it. Yeah. And I make sure my car is nearby. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of little steps you can take. Yeah. But generally on a live gig, I'll have two small amps so that if one goes down, I have one to play through. Yeah. I'll also have a pedal board that I know how to bypass. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I make sure that if a pedal goes down, I can just bypass it really quickly. Yep. And then I always have two guitars because I, I often break a string during a live right. set because you're you're going hard. You know, yeah. it's it's it, it happens. And you're right. I remember once I had a pair of Marshall JCM 800s. Mm -hmm. So I, I followed my rule and, and brought these amps. Yeah. But back in those days, I had the bright idea of wiring my own AC cables. Okay. I made my own AC cables <laughs> and they both failed. And so I had no amp. What a nightmare. I don't even yeah. want to remember that thing. So the first one went down, and okay, okay, here's the second one, and then the second one went down. Wiring your own power cables? That's, that's, that's a bold choice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not an electrician. I think a lot of these things come down to you have a list of what can go wrong. And the yeah. more things you can cross off that yeah. list, you yeah. have a solution for it, yeah. the, how, the more it helps you overcome the nerves yeah. of playing a gig or a session. The other thing we talked about that I do is I make a shorthand chart of the arrangement of the song. Because mm -hmm. if you're doing 12 songs and each song has a particular bridge, one goes to D minor, one goes to E flat, one goes here, one goes there... Sometimes it's hard, even if you're studying and memorizing, to remember everything. So I'll make a chart with a Sharpie, yep. usually on a, a piece of card stock that's kind of stiff. I can just throw down on the stage, and it'll have intro, verse, chorus, 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 you know, whatever the, the actual arrangement mm -hmm. of the song is. And then if there are some chords that are eluding me, like in the bridge, I'll actually have the bridge chords real big, E flat minor, D flat, yep. C slash, whatever. And it's also, some songs have tricky arrangements. Yeah. And maybe there's a double chorus or a five bar intro or, or like an added bar of two. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Two, four bar. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And those things you can put in shorthand so that they're visible and they're written big and visible. And then when you finish the song, you can literally kick it out of the way. Right. 
and the next one's laying right there. There are pl plenty of musicians who use charts when they play live, but yeah. generally you want to be free of the chart when you're playing live. You want to have it rote. You know? yeah, yeah, especially, you know, for yeah. certain genres of music, you're not yeah. going to see, like, you're not going to see someone shredding an awesome rock solo whilst looking at a chart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can't well, power slide and keep your eyes on the chart. Whilst you're going. Okay, one of the things you've talked about is doing a long warm-up, and that ties into getting there early. Like, if you get there early and you get a parking space, you're not driving anymore, you're mm -hmm. not worried about being late, Yeah. maybe you meet everybody who's at the venue, you make sure your rig is set up before anybody else, yeah. everything's working great, then all of a sudden you have all this time to warm up. And I do that. I'll have a guitar strap. I'll walk around silently warming up. Yeah. Sometimes for two, three hours before the gig. Yeah. I remember when I was on tour, I would warm up for maybe even four hours before the gig, just walking around with it, talking to people, yes. just settling in. But you actually do stretches too. Yeah. You know, a big thing for me is that uh, anxiety and things can manifest itself in just a general tightening of, yeah, of right. my body you know right. and and you know something that I've always heard you talk about is the importance of keeping a good loose feel with your hands you're not wasting energy you're not fighting your own body you're not pressing down too hard and like moving your left hand too much yeah stretches like I there was one that I saw Nita Strauss mention which is the sort of you put your hand out forwards and you just sort of oh, bring yeah. that hand back you can also put pressure on it with the right hand and stretch it even more absolutely it's yeah. a good one yeah, yeah and you can do it sideways yeah. and turn yeah. your head and all yeah. sorts of things yeah and another one putting your hands out forwards and clasping your hands um for about 10 seconds and you let it drop and you just anything that helps your fingers just feel more lively for me, it's always the neck and the shoulders. Mm. And I remember being on stage and I, I watched a couple of people in the audience kind of imitate me going like this. Yeah. And it was like, oh, I need to stop doing that. That's wasted <laughs> energy. Plus, I look like a geek. <laughs> so I finally stopped that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a big thing because when you're performing, it's all about looking confident. Yeah. You Shoulders back. Yeah. Uh, you're looking outwards. You know, you don't want to be always staring at the guitar and things like that. It's, you know, the, a performance is a performance. Entirely. Absolutely. Like and I actually do that on stage. I pretend to be relaxed and confident. Yeah. And then a lot of times that pretending becomes real. Right. So I'll walk out there and even though I'm nervous, I'll just kind of smile and be kind of loose and whatever, mm -hmm. plug in, whatever. And and it actually kind of, if you look back at film of mm -hmm. you when you're nervous, you yeah. don't see the nerves. Yeah. It's, it really does and work. And it's funny. And I think it also helps, too, because if you're staring at your guitar, yes. there's this tendency that the world goes into this nightmare scenario. And you're yeah. like, they hate me, they hate me, they hate me. This yes. is awful. I've heard this a hundred times. But if you look out and you're confident and you make eye contact, yeah. if you can, you know, you get this sense of people want you to sound good. Yeah. No one goes to a show wanting it to sound bad. Let's talk about the mistake. And I have found sometimes it's really beneficial mm -hmm. to make a mistake at the beginning of the set. Yeah. Because once you've done it and nobody's died and everybody's still <laughs> having fun, it's kind of like, well, I made the mistake. I can make another one if I want, probably. Yeah. It's, everything's okay. Let's yeah. just go. You yeah. know, it's, yeah. it's, it's really great sometimes to make a mistake early on and get it out of the way rather than on song seven, you're going, okay. I haven't, I haven't made a mistake yet. Is it going to happen? It's, it's just great sometimes yeah. just to, to get it done. You Absolutely. Know? <laughs> and the fact is that you're the one noticing those mistakes yeah. so much more than anyone else. I think like over 50% of any mistake that you make on stage, like over 90% of any mistake you make on stage, no one listening yeah. is going to go, like, oh, the guitarist missed yeah. one of the notes in the arpeggio right there. Yeah. No one's listening for that. Okay, so I did a one-off last summer. Mm -hmm. And because it was a one-off, it was kind of nerve-wracking. And it was at the Experience Festival, the PRS Experience Festival. And what was hard about it is Paul Reed Smith is a friend of mine. And somehow he was doing me a favor by putting me like last on the show. It was like a three-hour show of guitar players. So I had to stand there and watch every guitar player go up and be amazing, <sighs> thinking, I'm not that amazing. I'm not that guy. I can't do that. I'm not going to be doing that. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> so what I did is I stood backstage and I warmed up, like I said. Yeah. And it, it didn't help in a way because I kept watching these guys go up and do three songs each. Yeah. David Grissom, Davey Knowles, all these amazing guys go up and just shred. Yeah. And I'm standing there going, okay, okay, well, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to keep practicing. Okay, yeah. okay. But then I went out in the audience and I joined my family and I realized the audience is not seeing what I'm seeing, they're seeing 
basically an energy come off the stage. Yeah. And if you play one note or a simple blues phrase from the heart, yeah. In an audience at the very back, right. it, it really can mean more if you're simple. So you go, okay, that's a saving grace for me. Absolutely. I, I can I can play simply, I can be myself. All you're really trying to do is give them an energy and a feeling and an emotion and a message and make yeah. them feel something 100%. and join you in something. <clears throat> and you know what else? And that ties into if you're playing in a club and maybe you're following or you know someone else on the bill or someone in the crowd is a guitarist who you admire. And that can really, uh, you know, rack up the, te the tension and the stakes for you. But I think it's imp so important to remember that fact that you are, in your own right, a musician. You're expressing yourself musically. If you do something authentic and real and you, and you trust the fact that you have your own musical uh, voice, there's something that anyone can enjoy. Yeah, in absolutely music. true. And complexity is not necessarily the most powerful thing. Right. In music, uh, virtuosity can be powerful, but simplicity and emotion right. really translates to the people at the very back of the venue. So over prepare, get there early, bring yep. lots of extra stuff. Yes. Study in advance if you can mm -hmm. at all. Put some cheat sheets down on the, yeah. the floor of the stage. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Understand that you have your own value as a musician and your own voice. And that even if it's a sub gig, you still got that gig because people trust that you can handle it. Absolutely. I think we can go out in the world and play now. <laughs> exactly. Just a <about> matter. <laughs>